Larian Studios, a name and everyone and their mother knows today, but that wasn't always the case. I remember the first game I played by Larian, way back in 2009, Divinity 2. At the time, it was just a decent action RPG. You play as a dragon slayer, tasked with killing the last of the dragons. Gameplay was typical ARPG fare. Pick your weapon or spell of choice and go about slaying monsters and solving quests. You gain a pretty neat traversal form about midway through the game that plays slightly more arcade-like, but it's used rather sparingly, and interestingly enough, it plays into the plot. Now, the worst part of Divinity 2 is without a doubt probably the combat. <laughs> Melee feels floaty and ranged magic combat is mostly just dodge fire, dodge fire in an endless loop. Now, where the game shines is Larian's style of writing, which is just as impressive here as it is in their future titles. If you're at all familiar with a game I'll mention more later, Original Sin 2, then you'll quickly notice that they're wit throughout the entire game. It's very Monty Python-esque, and I couldn't love it anymore. Like a certain wizard, you know, that rhymes, which feels kind of straight out of the Holy Grail. Creatures from this broken dale, fear now all my magic gale, and know the greatest mage by far, is the mighty Belagar! It's all just hilarious, good writing, and fun. There's a very gothic, you know, Knights of the Old Republic feel to it. The world is open, but keeps you on the critical path quite well. Side quests are few, rich, and detailed, instead of just being fetch me ten wolf furs because we need a pad for content. Now, fast forwarding to 2014, with what would be considered, I would say, the start of Larian making some headway with fans and critics in terms of popularity, also partial crowdfunding helped, with the release of Divinity Original Sin. I'm going to kind of breeze through this one, as everything this game does, Original Sin 2 just dwarfs it in comparison. Combat was quite good, actually, even if it really was kind of easy. There were no bosses that took like hours to beat, and almost every fight had the same strategy. The combat in this game is based more around luck and dice rolls than strategizing. Story was kind of underwhelming, so many names are thrown around, characters aren't really developed, and you couldn't really connect with a lot of them. Side quests were okay, nothing terrible, but nothing that I really remember. Overall, the first Divinity game was an enjoyable experience, but not one that I would ever replay in a world where the second original Sin game exists. It has a lot of faults, and as much as I tried not to compare it too much to its successor, my biggest gripes with the game is how just like everything is better in Original Sin 2. And now we talk about Original Sin 2. Back in 2017, this game was the game that truly opened people's eyes to Larian. I'd say I was kind of squinting a bit before, uh, but now that my eyes were starting to open up. Financed via a successful crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter, which raised two million, Original Sin 2 was a commercial and critical success, selling over a million copies in two months. It is frequently cited as one of the best role-playing games of all time, with significant praise given to its writing, story, interactivity, combat system, cooperative multiplayer, and music. While Original Sin 2 offers a wide variety of preset class builds, it has an otherwise open-ended class system that allows a high degree of flexibility. Combat of the game is turn-based and uses an action point system, and in addition to health, characters may also be protected by physical and or magic armor, which will negate incoming physical or magic damage and block negative status effects. If you enjoyed co-op in the first game, then you'll also love it here, but you can now co-op with up to four players instead of two. There's an extensive dialogue tree with many interesting ways to solve quests, some of the best companions written for a CRPG, and any and all NPCs can die, though killing certain individuals may render some quest incompletable or force the player to find other ways to proceed. Freedom in this game is almost second to none. However, this is not a game for everybody. The barrier for entry is quite high and the difficulty can be very unforgiving even if you're only one level difference from the enemies you encounter. Highly recommended for any CRPG fans. Now we've reached the center of the universe. This is Valhalla. This is Nirvana. This is Baldur's Gate 3. From humble beginnings in its 2020 early access release, Larian spent 
three more years fine-tuning and developing this D&D masterpiece. The game is based on the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons rule set, though it includes tweaks and modifications that Larian found necessary in adapting it to a video game. For example, the combat system is more in favor of the player than in the tabletop version to make the game more enjoyable, though save scumming your dice rolls definitely helps. From the story, to the gameplay, to the freedom of choice and artistic expression in deciding how you want to solve almost every quest, and the characters. These are some of the very best companion characters in an RPG since, I'd say, the early days of Bioware. From Astarian to Lazel to Carlac to Shadowheart to Gale, the quality of writing that was put into these characters is second to none. Presentation is another reason this game drew in the more casual audience in comparison to Divinity 2. Having that Bioware feel of characters up close and personal when exchanging dialogue just looks better than what's presented in the Divinity games. There's also the fact that this game is much easier and user-friendly and has some of the most fun co-op you could have this generation. This game has put Larian so high up on a pedestal, it's hard to see if they'll ever come down. It's the same feeling people had when The Witcher 3 was released, at least comparable in my mind. Baldur's Gate 3 received critical acclaim with praise for its gameplay, narrative, and production quality. It won many Game of the Year awards and became the first game that won the top award at all five major ceremonies at the Golden Joystick Awards, the Game Awards, the Dice Awards, the Game Developer's Choice Awards, and the British Academy Game Awards. It is one of the best video games ever made. So what's next for both Larian and Baldur's Gate? Well, unfortunately for Wizards of the Coast, Larian has opted to move on and do their own thing. While they love the setting of Baldur's Gate, and Dungeons and Dragons as a whole, they felt kind of pigeonholed by some of the rules they needed to make to be as authentic to D&D as possible. I'm pretty sure Sven Vinke, uh, the founder and CEO of Larian, has expressed interest in some form of like a sci-fi RPG, which sounds awesome and is surely something I'm very interested in as a huge Mass Effect fan. But what does this mean for future Baldur's Gate games? Well, they have the biggest hill I have ever seen someone attempt to climb. How can you possibly follow up on Baldur's Gate 3, let alone without the people <laughs> who made it what it is? The only thing I don't really want is for the next game, or any form of D&D, to feature any of the characters or companions from Baldur's Gate 3. I want Baldur's Gate 3 to exist almost like in its own perfect bubble, with no outside interference or changes. Now, Baldur's Gate 4 isn't currently in development, but Hasbro has stated that the franchise will indeed continue despite Larian Studios stepping away. They're currently looking for the correct partner to bring Baldur's Gate 4 to life, but a sequel would have to also set itself apart from Baldur's Gate 3. The pressure to meet the bar that Larian Studios set while also creating a game that stands on its own outside of Baldur's Gate 3 with its own unique voice and characters it just seems impossible. It's trying to catch lightning in a bottle twice with the added difficulty of now holding a lightning rod.